All right, thanks for coming in, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, here's just a little run through of what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be talking about a website redesign for the AFB.org website, that uh, is the American Foundation for the Blind. Uh, this was an interesting project because uh, though we do develop Drupal websites, uh, as you can see, for this project, the client has a dev team and they did the development. And what we provided was the front end. Uh, so this is not exactly a decoupled Drupal talk, uh, but it is about uh, a talk about process, um, about um, collaboration, and ultimately deliverables. And you'll get to see all that good stuff. Uh, so first, some introductions. Uh, my name is Britton Bailey. I'm the Director of Design and User Experience at Calumna. Um I'm based just outside of Toronto, uh, in a little town called Cambridge. I've been designing websites since about 1996. Um, before that, I was a graphic designer working in print and multimedia, back when CD-ROMs were a thing. And uh, in the last 23 years, I've just done, done just about everything that there is to do, although I'm not a programmer or a developer per se. I've touched pretty much every part of the process, from testing, project management, uh, to actual design and building sites. Uh, I gave um, uh, this very same talk just a few weeks ago at the Accessibility Camp Toronto um, event. And um, that was a very interesting uh, event. If y'all have ever been to it, uh, you'll know it's got a very diverse uh, group of attendees and speakers. So that was an honor. Um, and at Calamuna, what I'm responsible for is our design content and strategy uh, practice. So I manage the uh, design and strategy team. I'm also overseeing the discovery and design phases on our larger client projects, like this one. So as I mentioned, I work at Calamuna. We work primarily with socially impactful institutions, associations, agencies, and governments to help them solve today's most pressing problems. And we do this by empowering them with the research strategy, design, and technology that will help them transform their organizations so they can better serve the needs of their organizations and communities. And that was a really um, prominent theme in this project because, as I mentioned, our client had a dev team and they wanted to build the end, the website in the end, uh, the, uh, at the end of the day. Um, so what we empowered them with was process and, uh, and the design and content strategy. Uh, we're based in Oakland, a hotbed of social activism, uh, also very close to San Francisco, many universities. Um, but we're also a very distributed team. So we have members basically across North America and Canada and the US. Uh, one of our members uh, is down in Costa Rica at the moment. Actually, that's where he lives. And we also have uh, one of our long-term members in Romania for European representation. These are some of the organizations who we work with. Um, and you'll note a bit of a theme here. A lot of these are nonprofits. Um, some of them are Canadian. Some representatives are here today in uh, Action Canada. Uh, we also work with CSI in Toronto. Um, and there's one client here that we worked with many years ago uh, called Bookshare. And that was actually uh, fortuitous because that was the, one of the connecting elements in how we got to work with AFB. Bookshare is a website that provides books for the blind, and essentially uh, trying to make uh, as many books as possible accessible to those who are blind or visually impaired. Uh, we also work with a lot of universities and research centers. So again, uh, what we're trying to do is work as much as possible with uh, groups who are trying to change the world. Uh, to remove barriers wherever possible. Now, AFB has been around for a long time. You may not all be as familiar with them because they're an American nonprofit, uh, but they've been uh, around since 1921. Um, they're a leader in expanding possibilities for the nearly 25 million Americans living with uh, vision loss. Now, they're a national nonprofit. Um, they champion access and equality, and they stand at the forefront of new technologies and evidence based advocacy. Uh, one of their most prominent ambassadors is Helen Keller, who you may have heard of. Uh, like Helen Keller, AFB's most, um, their most famous ambassador, they are committed to creating a more equitable world for people with disabilities. And um, 
this project was really interesting because they have been around for a long time, but they realized that it was they needed to change the way they were doing things. Um, and this is a quote from Kirk Adams, uh, their president and CEO, who we had the pleasure of speaking with. Um, and he had a really profound impact on our team because of his really positive attitude and like the, the notion of barriers were really just just things to get past in life, uh, in society, and, and, and of course that empowered us in this project to figure out ways to get through some of the challenges um, working and collaborating with members of different, uh, different abilities. So I did want to mention um, the Nonprofit Technology Conference, NTC, uh, which was where our CEO, Andrew Malice, um, met Elizabeth Neal from AFP. And she was the Director of Communications there. At that event, they chatted about Bookshare, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. And the timing was perfect, perfect because they had just um, issued an, R an RFP to redesign their website. So we put together a proposal, and um, it all worked out. The numbers made sense, so we got to work together. So then it was a matter of bringing together the team. And this was a really important aspect of this whole project. Um, and one that we all, that, that we recognized was so important, and what I'd like to recommend to, to all of you, is to try to assemble as diverse of a team as stakeholders as possible. Now this is often a challenge, to get people from different levels or, uh, or parts of the organization to care about the website project. Uh, but it was really instrumental for this one. So we had a variety of perspectives at the table from the earliest planning stages right through to development. Um, and this was also really key because we had members on the team who were skilled screen reader users and people who used assistive technology daily. Um, and that was, of course, the fastest way to uncover any problems in your template or in your code with regards to accessibility. And also you want to be able to consider different viewpoints and priorities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later on about ways you can help foster creativity when you have members with different capabilities and you're working in a medium that typically is very visual. So this was the AFB team. Um, we had members from the comms team, uh, from the dev team, two of whom were screen reader users. Um, and everyone was familiar with the accessibility standards. So we're talking about the WCAG. 2.1 now. Um, and you might be familiar with the levels A, AA, AAA. Um, well, AA is kind of like the, the new bar, what you have to hit to have a, what's considered an accessible website. But for AFB, it was really important to get to AAA as much as possible. Um, and also, I want to mention a little shout out to the AFB consulting team. We were able to um, AFB also has a team that provides uh, uh, professional services to do accessibility monitoring and testing. And they play the role as part of as well. And other members throughout the organization. Everyone was really interested in, in this project, which is great. On the Calaluna team, we had a pretty broad uh, array of players as well. We had UX research and design representation, communication strategy, uh, uh, front-end design, front-end development, uh, of course, project management, but you'll note there aren't any back-end developers on the, on the screen because that was all handled by AFB. Okay, so a little bit about the project itself. So what were we designing? Um, the old AFB.org had a lot going for it. Um, I mean, it was a little bit old looking, a little dated, but it was fully accessible, had a lot of nice interactive features, and it was well indexed by search engines, as you'll see in the the site was also huge, uh, and the back end was getting pretty creaky. So it was, it was time for a remake. While technically mobile friendly, its responsive design was really clunky, and, uh, and overall it was very cluttered looking. But most importantly, um, they needed to update the information architecture to reflect and explain AFB's new strategic mission. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, at the beginning of, our, of the project, we like to show this diagram to our stakeholders to kind of give them a, a sense of what we're going to be going through together. Um, this is what I like to call a bubble diagram. On the far left, we have our discovery phase where we're asking lots of questions, the who's, what's, and why's. 
uh, to try to uncover insights that will inform our content strategy and design. And in the middle, we're really doing its design and implementation, which is very amorphous and organic and a little bit messy, but as we're you know, nailing down our information architecture and then getting into like, you know, the look and feel of things, we're also looking at code and how to build the components that will build this web, that make up this website. What's different about this project, as I mentioned before, is we weren't going to be doing the Drupal part. So the last bubble, which is a delivery and support, was actually handled by the plan. So, as I mentioned, when we started the project as part of discovery, we discovered that AFB had been undergoing some major changes. And they had gone through a year-long strategic planning process, in fact, leading up to this project. And during that period, they had talked to lots of people, both inside and outside the blindness field. They asked, what can we do as an organization to deliver the greatest long-term value for people who are blind or visually impaired? What they determined was that they needed to focus on identifying the most challenging barriers faced by blind people, to use research and data analysis tools to understand these barriers and identify solutions, and then share that knowledge uh, about these challenging issues in order to make positive changes in the lives of the blind while working in collaboration and partnership with leaders in the blind and the vision community. So prior to this, they had been basically producing content and, 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 and trying to work with people who were blind to help them cope with life. But now they were realizing they needed to go up a level and actually work on changing the system itself. Changing laws, changing policies, changing attitudes. So we had a lot to figure out. How are we going to do this in the scope of this website redesign? Um, this slide shows a listing of all the different activities that we might conduct during a redesign project. The ones that are bold, um, pink if you're not color uh, are the ones we did for this project. So not everything, but quite a few. And as I mentioned earlier, this is really a big project about, this is really about collaboration. Um, we had to figure out which tools were going to work for a team that consisted of both visually able and blind and everything in between in terms of our, our team makeup. And we wanted to make sure that the creative process was accessible as well, um, so that everyone could participate. So, um, you know, AFB gave us a lot of feedback on how to better communicate, uh, especially when we're trying to communicate visual design work to stakeholders who may have been blind or had no vision. Um, and we had to adapt some of our discovery activities, um, such as collaborative sketching sessions, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So just in case you're curious, um, here are some of the tools that we had to discuss and work through. We, uh, at our agency, normally use JIRA as our project management tool. To, we're an agile-based agency, and we like to you know, use JIRA to fill out all these tickets and have all sorts of comments and track time and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Jira is terrible for accessibility. So, um, interestingly enough, Trello is pretty good. So, we, uh, while we worked with Jira on, on, on our team, the AFB team was using Trello, and we used a tool called Unito to synchronize issues between those two project management systems. Okay, so that that's great. Um, our team is all on the Google suite of tools, so we're used to using Hangouts for meetings. But Google Hangouts isn't very accessible. So AFB was used to using Zoom. Okay, we'll switch to Zoom for those calls. No problem. Lucidchart is a, a, is a web-based tool for diagramming and drawing you know, pretty charts and stuff. Uh, but it's completely useless to someone who's blind. So we uh, altered some of our processes and deliverables to use good old Google Sheets because the spreadsheet is actually, you know, accessible data in the table. And while Google Slides is okay, it's not really great. It doesn't have the same uh, uh, semantic structure as Google Docs. So rather than delivering deli um, reports in a slide format, we just use Docs instead. Okay, so some of the business needs uh, that needed to be addressed for this project are pretty interesting. 
And we first needed to really get our heads around, well, what were they, especially in this organization that was undergoing this massive strategic shift. So we started by conducting stakeholder interviews, right? We go to the source, and I mentioned we talked to uh, Kirk Adams, but we also talked to many other members of their team. And in addition to uh, conducting interviews, we also did, uh, state, we did uh, email questionnaires because we just didn't have time to talk to everyone. And not everyone was necessarily available. Uh, but we were able to gather really rich insights from a variety of stakeholders this way. And as I mentioned, one of the most important things we learned about was this new strategic shift. Um, then we conducted a comparative analysis. And you may be familiar with a competitive analysis, but that doesn't really make sense in this context, so we just switched the name a little bit. Um, and we looked at uh, some other nonprofits that AFB recommended. Um, one, and we chose three that were most similar to AFB in terms of their missions to help change culture and policy, because that's where they wanted to go. Um, so we looked at the um, Urban Institute, which is urban.org, we looked at NAACP, uh, the National Institute for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Elizabeth Laser Pediatric AIDS Foundation, PetAIDS.org. And in order to make sense of what we were looking at, we didn't just like look at some websites and you know cherry pick some great things. We wanted to actually be kind of objective about what were the strengths and weaknesses of each. So we came up with this uh, uh, rubric to evaluate the different sites based on some criteria like visual design, navigation, you know, um, how is the messaging and brand voice. What was the audience engagement like? Um, and you know, you can, you know, for your projects, you might come up with different criteria, but this is what we use for us. Um, and then we needed to really understand who we were designing this new website for. So for this project, we didn't create personas, though sometimes we do, um, for a few reasons. In this case, uh, mostly time and budget restrictions. We were trying to do a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, but also because they were pivoting to focus on an entirely new audience, um, it meant that you know we, we didn't have the luxury of doing a long, extensive audience research phase, um, which would, would require a lot of time and effort um, and research to do properly. So instead, we focused on the key user types that would represent the kinds of people that AFB was looking to connect with. So these are the audience types that they were already serving very well. Right, people losing their vision, including family members, you know, job seekers who are either blind or visually impaired, educators and health or rehabilitation professionals, uh, blind people interested in assistive technology and use, and, um, and people interested in Helen Keller and the history of blindness in America. And that was actually a huge portion of their audience, as we learned. But their new target audiences were completely different. Instead, they wanted to target donors, funders, sponsors, and corporate partners, legislators and policymakers, academics, researchers, and educators, nonprofits with overlapping goals, HR, employers, consulting clients, and journalists in the media. Again, trying to change the system itself. So we're like, okay, this is going to be an interesting exercise in content strategy because they didn't want to lose their old audience along the way. So we wanted to understand from the stakeholders what was most important to them in terms of the, what their dream website would be like. So we did this exercise called, you know, uh, what are the five words you would use to describe your dream website? And from there, we got our guiding principles. So these were the, the guiding principles for this project. And it's not surprising that accessible was the word that came up the most. Um, but authoritative, motivating, modern, and easy to use were all really important. And in addition, being flexible, clean, bold, and fresh. And some of those words might kind of stand out because they don't seem like they would be appropriate for a site generally um, targeting people who are interested in blindness. But it was really important that this website looked good. That was something that came across from all the stakeholders because they were trying to appeal to people who could see and who would be judging, judging them and their authoritativeness and their, their, their organization based on how their website looked. So we got that. But that also made it a challenge because as I mentioned, we had our, our accessibility guidelines that we were also trying to achieve. 
but we'll get to that in a bit. So we really need to understand user behavior. As I mentioned, it had a huge audience, we didn't want to lose it. We wanted to understand what were people doing on the website. So for that, we looked at analytics um, and used a few different techniques here. One of which was to install Hotjar on the home page, uh, just to be able to see how people were interacting with that, with their main page. Um, this was just using you know, the free thousand, first thousand page views um, installation, uh, looking at desktop, tablet, and smartphone. We were tracking mouse clicks, scrolling, and looking at mouse movement um, in order to generate these, these heat maps. And you'll notice that the, the middle image of the mouse tracking has a huge amount of activity on it, especially relative to the amount of clicks you see on the screen on the far left. And this was really interesting to us and indicated to us how people were interacting with the page itself as some people would scroll across using um, uh, magnifiers. They were literally moving their mouse across the page line by line to be able to see and magnify you know, in, their, in their tools what, uh, what the content was. Um, but it was also important for us to realize you know, what people were clicking and what they weren't. Um, it's, it might be a little bit hard to see, but in the very top part of the far left screen, uh, there's a little button, a little, two little buttons to change the font size. And we had a really interesting discussion and debate about whether or not to keep the font size selector buttons. And this, this exercise actually prompted us to keep it. Because even though the browser natively can handle font resizing, if you code your website properly, uh, we, there was a benefit to having those as visual indicators that that was an important consideration for people with low vision. So they stayed. We also looked at analytics, as I mentioned. We set up a Google Data Studio report to help visualize the data um, for ourselves, mostly, but also to communicate what, was, what, what people were interested in and where they were coming from and what kind of devices they were using. Um, what's really interesting across the bottom, those three pie charts, the one on the far left is the traffic source or sources. And 75% of the, of the traffic was coming from organic search, which is pretty huge. Also note that um, it was like more than three quarters new visitors, not too surprising, but about a 50-50 split between desktop and mobile and tablet, which was really high and surprised us. But we're like, okay, so this site really needs to work well in mobile as well. Um, and then we wanted to dive a little bit deeper and look at some of the user flows on the site because we noticed like, so there's all this search traffic that's coming into the site. What are they looking for and where are they going? Well, this, um, this behavioral flow diagram is interesting because it's a little bit upside down. The, most of the traffic is coming through the very bottom block, which is like other. So, okay, what are they looking for? Where, and so we had to actually drill down, and I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you in a couple slides another diagram that really illustrates that people were not coming through the home page, in fact, essentially. That was the last place people were going. So when we're thinking about our content strategy and, and thinking about, okay, how are people accessing content? What are people looking for? We wanted to really um, be able to visualize and understand what, was, what, what, what content was resonating for people and what was being engaged with. So we conducted a content audit. You know, this is, and we did the usual stuff. We're looking at understanding every, from every single page from top down, uh, what's there, what are the challenges, where is the room for improvement, um, because all this stuff's really important. It impacts our navigation, uh, SEO, our information architecture, page layouts, and everything. So here is uh, a diagram that illustrates their long tail of content. This is just the top 200 pages. And it kept going. We could have, I mean, it, it just wasn't enough for them to show 500 pages, but it just keeps going. They have so much evergreen content that was still sparking joy for people. Um, and because they had always followed W3C guidelines, they had really great semantic structure. Um, I mean, and they, were, they had been around for so long, there were all these inbound links. So they were getting tons of traffic, and we didn't want to lose any of that, so we had to be really smart about uh, you know, redirect strategies. And also, 
having safety nets for people who might be coming to our new site to be able to find that old stuff. So as part of our process, when we're trying to reorganize content, we do an exercise called content mapping. Um, and just before I get into that, like we were looking at page depth as a concern. And page depth basically refers to how many numbers, how many clicks you have to make to reach a specific page on the site from the home page. Um, you know, by, by, by taking the shortest path. Now, the biggest bucket of content on their site was at the sixth level. Now, that's not terrible, but I mean, it's pretty bad. Um, but it meant that, you know, we could obviously, you know, one of our goals was to do a better job of surfacing that content sooner. You know, that's just too many clicks to get to the good stuff we're after. But when we looked even further, we realized that 85% of the pages were between four and eight levels deep. So we really did have a lot of work to do there. Some of the, of the content was nine and 10 levels deep. I mean, that's like an adventure to get to that stuff. So we were really challenged to come up with something that was gonna be, uh, make, make sense, but be a lot more streamlined and simple. So here's just a little cutout of our content map so you can see what it looks like. Um, and we started our reorganizing process efforts using this, this technique. Um, but of course, this wasn't something we could um, communicate to some of our stakeholders. Uh, because again, this is visual. This is done using lucid chart. So from, th from this point, once we had kind of got a general feel for how things were going to be organized, we then put everything into a Google spreadsheet. And that's what the, uh, the, blind, and the blind users on uh, the stakeholders were able to use to navigate and validate uh, our recommendations. And we ended up doing the same thing for taxonomy and content types. Um, but we wanted to validate, because um, testing your content organization is really important. It's really important to do it before you build your website. Uh, so we, did a, we used a technique called tree testing. Now, um, for those, just to give you a bit of background for those who may not know what tree testing is. So the way a website is organized, you can think of it as the home page as being like the trunk of your tree, with each major navigational category being like a branch that you can follow. And the articles and elements of information are like the leaves on the branches that people are eventually going to get to. So in tree testing, we're trying to see how people are able to navigate that structure to get to the content they're after. So once you have a draft outline of how you think you're going to organize your content, it's a great way to see if your menu categories and where you put things make sense to your representative visitors. Um, and then you can see which branches people choose when you give them a test, like find this piece of content about X. So we did this um, actually with, with AFB. They, these were conducted in a moderated format, so we didn't just uh, do these unmoderated because there's a lot of rich insights you can get from uh, speaking to people and hearing them think their way through your information architecture. Uh, and TreeJack is a great tool. It's, uh, it's by a company called Optimal Workshop. Uh, they also do car have a card sorting uh, tool called Optimal Sort. Um, and it gives us great reports on things like how many guesses it took before the user found what they were looking for, what their success rates were, and where the majority of people were looking for a particular items. So we were able to make some tweaks to our labeling and to our information architecture as a result of that. Okay, so now we think we've got our content all kind of organized and figured out, but we still had something really important uh, to work out, which is, so AFP had this new strategic direction, but they still needed to figure out what to say and how to say it. So we helped them with that. And we're like, okay, let's do some workshops. So we did a positioning uh, statement workshop with them. And this is a, an example of a, of a framework that you can use. So this, using this model, you can kind of get a, a broad outline of who the organization is, what makes them special, and why anybody would care. So for AFB, it looked like this. For Americans who are blind or losing sight, who lack equal access to education, employment, and other social institutions, AFB conducts and promotes research into policies and practices that influence institutional decision makers to increase opportunities for their success 
Unlike other organizations for the blind, AFB has a long record of creating trusted, objective knowledge that leads to positive policy change. Now, this is not something that would ever be displayed publicly. This is not on the website. That's not the point. This is to give the stakeholders and the team a grounding and a framework upon which to build their message and strategy. Cue the next exercise. Okay, so what do you need to say to who? For this, we conducted a messaging map workshop. So in this exercise, we're looking at helping the communications team figure out how to articulate their calls to action for the specific target audiences that they're looking to reach. And these activities provided the foundation for the website's uh, new content strategy in terms of what they were saying and how they were saying it. Then we got into design. So we got the messaging, we got the content organized. What is it going to look like? So, as I mentioned earlier, we do we like to conduct these collaborative sketching workshops whenever we can with our stakeholders. It's a great way to get diverse ideas and different perspectives on what a page might look like or how it might be, um, you know, how it might how, how the elements might come together. But we had to, of course, adapt our processes for this project because. Um, not everyone on the team was cited. So, whereas most of our sketching uh, workshop output looks like this, uh, some of the members produced their sketches using a text editor. And that was really eye-opening to us because essentially at the end of the day what's most important is the information on the page and how it's organized. So that worked really well and we were able to collaborate with our blind and low vision users as well. We ended up conducting two sketching workshops with the AFB involving your stakeholders, and they did another one without us to do some interior pages, because they really liked the process. And it empowered them to kind of go off and work out some of the problems that we, we just didn't have the bandwidth and the time to do that. And from those sketching uh, workshops, we were able to get into wireframing, right? Without just starting from scratch, we now had a pool of really great ideas that had been discussed and deliberated, and we had identified, okay, what works from these ideas, what's not gonna work, and how can we bring the best of, the, of all of the different concepts together into wireframes. So these are the homepage wireframes for desktop and mobile, uh, synthesizing the best takeaways from those sketching workshops, and uh, this was able to inform the layouts for us in the few pages. Now these wireframes were then used to build low fidelity clickable prototypes in a tool called InVision. Obviously, that wasn't for everyone uh, because, again, it's a very visual based tool. But for the sighted people, we still wanted to make sure we were surfacing any potential issues uh, with labeling and organization. And then we wanted to, of course, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the session, uh, make it something that looked beautiful. So this was a challenge. We had some pretty intense constraints. We were looking for triple WCAG 2.13, triple A con color contrast ratios. Um, and also work with um, their complete lack of branding. All they had was a logo. So even, even the logo, they weren't 100% happy with. So we had to tweak a few things. Uh, but this is a, 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 slide, a style tile that we produced. So you can see across the top there's a color palette which we did get to uh, AAA contrast using the right combinations in the right, what, like, in the right places. Um, and this is a bit of a mosaic of elements and components that would ultimately be built into a style guide. So once we had kind of a general direction for the little bits and pieces, we still needed to mock it up and see what it would look like as a full page. So we wanted to know, well, what's the home page going to look like? Okay, this is what the home page is going to look like. Um, of course, this is half on one side and half on the other, but you get the idea from top to bottom how all those elements from the previous slide come together to form a page. And this modular layer also uh, gave us the ability to easily highlight um, the new priorities for AFB. Uh, so that was something that was really important because they were really targeted on education, employment, and aging as being like three pillars for their, their, their new program. The other element that we were considering, as I mentioned earlier, was it had to be very mobile friendly. So every element here had been considered for its ability to flow through into the small screen. 
And then it was time to prototype. Ultimately, that was our, our deliverable for this project. We were hired to build, design and build, a prototype and a style guide that their dev team could then use uh, to theme the Drupal CMS. But why prototype? Well, first of all, you want to put your design and content front and center. So this gets real content into the mix. And it forced our stakeholders to figure out what the words were going to be. Because now they were going to see it in the browser and really be able to evaluate it, evaluate it um, in its native medium. It was also an opportunity to talk about code. So we're having conversations about standards. Uh, and in this project, code was the documentation that we were delivering. So we were looking at ways to provide consistency across the ecosystem of components and pages. And testing, of course, was super important. And this allowed us to test in the browser. Because now, unlike those clickable wireframes, we have a real testable uh, site that can be used with any browser or assistive technology. And of course, it's responsive as well, so we can test it in different devices. And finally, uh, using our own framework, Calistatic, which is a little bit like Pattern Lab, but different, uses KSS for the style guide. Um, the template files were shared with the CMS. So the code we were delivering was going to be literally used by the theme layer of Drupal to render the pages. Any changes we would make to the style guide would be reflected in the final website. Okay, you ready to see it? Yeah. Okay, so let's click on here. Oops, back. Hello. Can I do this here? Come on. Oh, it's going to be trouble for me, isn't it? What the heck? Where's my thing? I'm going to do it the old fashioned way. I think I have it open. There's that. Ah. Oh, come on. Okay. Yeah. Try that I'm going to try disconnecting. Really? Yeah. My phone number? Really? And 
a valid number? Yay! Okay. Oh my god. Sorry about that. Alright, get this out of my face. Okay, so this is. This is not prototype. Let's go to this dot for a second. Okay, so here's the style. Uh, thank you. Uh, what we've got over here is a bunch of different pages. So there is a prototype homepage. So it looks and feels like a real website. Got some shortcuts to some of the other pages that we prototyped. Uh, it really works. Uh, you can shrink and increase the font sizes, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, we've got hover effects. We've got buttons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And most importantly, we can find the edge of the screen. No, that's asking for too much. Shrink it down. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you go to afb.org, the real website, you'll see it looks virtually identical. Oh wait, there's more. Let's open this back up again. Let's go to some components. So in here we have the whole style that you can look at here. Now this is also responsive, so even style guide is responsive. So all of these elements here are native in code. So there's a blog entry title. And as we scroll down, you can see we've actually got access to the markup code. So this is the documentation that the dev, te dev team was able to then use to attach, you know, to reference in their theme uh, template class. And as I mentioned earlier, if we wanted to make any, any style changes, we can make those style changes to the style bank over here, and it would instantly impact the live website as well. And we've got some other elements, so hovers, uh, a bunch of different things. And again, the other important factor was all of this had to be accessible too. So not only were we producing you know, a website that was going to be accessible uh, in terms of its code, but the documentation also had to be accessible so that the dev team was able to make use of it. And what was really wonderful about the project was after we uh, delivered the style guide, um, in pieces, we didn't just wait until the end, they were, they were, they were actively getting um, iterative builds as we were adding components and working things out. They were able to start working on the CMS uh, actually months in advance of that, getting all the pieces ready because again we were very close. I thought we were very closely in terms of the architecture, the different components, so that and the content types. So they were able to set all that stuff up, and as we were refining the front end code, they were then able to basically just pick it up, add it to the theme there, and their, their CMS was ready to go by the time we were delivering the final code. And that's. Pretty much it for the prototype. Um, as I mentioned, it looks just like the real site. And if you go there today, you'll see it is essentially what I just showed you in the, uh, in the prototype. And uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, user testing um, because this was something that was also really important to not only during the information architecture phases of the project, but also the final rendered code and, the, and those prototype pages. So for this, um, we worked with AFB consulting team. Um, they handled this part. So they do a lot of uh, their usability testing using people who are blind or use assistive technology uh, to access the web. And they often do this remotely, and there's um, good reasons for this. Uh, by doing remote testing, people are in their own elements, using their own tools, and they're much more comfortable when they're reviewing the site. So it actually makes for a more natural and efficient way to do user testing. Because uh, that allowed them to get a realistic sense of um, you know, how this website would turn out. 
And as I mentioned, because we had prototyped it all in HTML, uh, we were able to use these prototype pages for all of this testing. Um, and that saved us a lot of headaches and a lot of uh, revisions later on. So I strongly urge you to build in time for usability testing in your own projects, and especially accessibility, uh, accessible user testing, which is becoming a more and more important issue. Many organizations and agencies are familiar with doing user testing, but not too many do accessible user testing. And that's something we're starting to see a little bit more of, and more of a demand for. So this project is a great opportunity for us to do it, but it really reinforced the importance of doing it for all projects, because Regardless of who your site is for or what your organization's mission might be, your users may have various abilities or levels of vision, and it's important that, their, that your content is accessible to them as well. So we did learn a few other things along the way, and we had some reflections. Um, you know, agreeing on tools was important, and those discussions were, were, were not just all up front. We did have a lot of uh, chats at the beginning to figure out what was going to work for everyone. Uh, but even as we were going along, we had to kind of improvise along the way and figure out, well, okay, we normally do this way. What are we going to do for this project? Um, we did forget to test inverted colors, and it wasn't so much the inverted colors that were an issue. I've got a little screenshot here of some of the testing that was done after the fact. Um, when we inverted the colors on the page, it just made it, all the all the photos that we thought were so beautiful and tasteful look really hideous, and apparently that um, turned off some of the stakeholders who were used to viewing websites with inverted colors. Um, but we did have a more uh, significant issue with uh, a little-known add-on to the JAWS screen reader called Zoom Test. Zoom Test has a tool called Invert Brightness. So this image that I'm showing shows the difference between the normal color, and we were testing different levels of blues and blacks on yellow, then what it looks like when you invert brightness versus inverting color. If you invert the color, we still had the high contrast ratio. But by inverting brightness, it's really interesting because the, the screens are made up of red, green, and blue. So not all colors invert the way you think they would. So as you can see down that middle column, by inverting the brightness, white on yellow is not very accessible. There's virtually no, con the contrast just went to plummeted. So we had to uh, rethink some of that and we're probably gonna have to tweak some of the yellows for the new design. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier, some of the diagrams were proven to be a little bit less accessible. Uh, so in those cases, we just defaulted to text. And I've got a little video here. I don't know if it's going to play. We can try. This was our stakeholder, his name. As Crispin has probably told you, um, AFB has been undergoing major changes over the last 18 months or so. We went through a year-long strategic planning process driven by stakeholder interviews and a comparative analysis of how AFB could create a more equitable world for people who are blind or visually impaired. We came away with a clear answer that AFB should shift from helping blind people and their families understand and navigate a complicated system of services to a bolder effort to change the system itself. So our challenge was how to convey concepts like systems change in a way that made sense to regular people and inspired them to take action. And of course, we wanted to continue to showcase best practices for fully accessible, inclusive website design. Kalamuna was the perfect partner for our website overhaul um, because they also brought a curious, analytical, and user-driven approach to their projects. Of course, we also loved that they had a very strong background in accessible web design and Drupal, which we had chosen as our new platform. But what was really most important was that they were committed to the same research-driven and user-focused design approach that AFB has always advocated and followed ourselves. I hope you'll explore AFB.org and let us know what you think of our results. Thank you. This is awesome. All right, and I 
That's what? Oh, Lady oh, Anne. Yes. Oh. You don't need to see that twice. And that's the presentation. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, the prototype. So I can read it out for you. That one. Yes. AFB. Dot. Netlify. Dot com. N e t l i f y. Slash style guide. Yes. Uh, met the, the needs and requirements. Right. So the question was, were there any, is there any uh, short list of activities to make sure on a project that you do conduct to ensure that your final results are successful? Well, I would say foundationally, um, always start with stakeholder interviews. Uh, that's been, uh, by and large, the most impactful, uh, high-value activity that we conduct for all of our projects. And that's really important to understand what all the different organizational needs are before we even get started. Um, other activities that we uh, really believe are important are, uh, and, and find a lot of value in are the content mapping exercise, in whatever format you do. It's a really great way to visualize uh, and, and collaboratively move the bits and pieces around. It's uh, similar to card sorting, but a little bit more organic. And you, it allows you to draw connections between the different site, bits of content that might live in one section but still need to be surfaced in other parts of the site. Uh, it's also helpful if you've got multiple systems that you're trying to connect and it can incorporate. Um, the sketching workshops are really tremendous at not only generating uh, a, a lot of great ideas in a short amount of time, they're also fantastic at getting consensus. Because what happens when you have a bunch of stakeholders in a room all vested in uh, coming up with a solution together and talking through different ideas, everyone gets on the same page very quickly. So you're all basically figuring it out together. And that makes it a lot easier because you're not just like, you know, coming back to a group with a bunch of concepts that have all been thought through and then having a bunch of people tearing them apart and telling, them, telling you why you got things wrong. Um, and the user testing, always user test, and any opportunity. Low fidelity user testing is great because if you do that early on, then you're not going to be needing to make as many changes in code later on. Um, so you know if you can get your wireframes, even if they're low fidelity, even if even if they're not, you don't you don't have everything figured out, get them in front of people quickly because then you're quickly validating and surfacing potential problems. It's a lot easier to fix something. Uh, when it's loose, um, then when it's all been structured and thought through, and, and people get kind of attached to bits and pieces. Right? So I guess those would be the highlights. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you all for attending. I uh, hope you have a wonderful conference. And uh, if you do have any thoughts or questions, I'd love to chat later. We'll be at the after party. Thank you. This is a little show that you want to connect with us. Uh, we're always looking for great talent. So find us on any of these platforms, our website, GitHub. Uh, all of this stuff that I showed you as far as the prototype is open source, so Calistatic, our, our framework, is on GitHub. Uh, we'd love you for you to use it, uh, try it out, and contribute back if you have ways to improve it. Thanks.